I like the attitude, you know? Well, fuck you. I'll do what I want. <laughs> never a scene without a club. But if you grew up in Orange County in the late 70s, early 80s, the Cuckoo's Nest was, uh... Be touring around Europe, you know, for years and years after, you get a lot of questions. Probably the most important thing to happen in Orange County. Cuckoo's Nest. Tell me something about the Cuckoo's Nest. A lot of crazy shit went down there. People were just crazy, crazy into it. It was all about the Cuckoo's Nest and just all of the crazy, wild, zany times that took place down there. And the first gig that I played with Black Flag was August 21st, I believe, 1981, and the first show was at the Cuckoo's Nest in Huntington Beach. In the surroundings of, you know, suburban comfort and, you know, manicured lawns and uh, these the perfect houses and people in their, their corporate jobs and these, the, the children of these people were just looking for some life. Authorities there, um make a, a point of depriving all the children who grow up in the, the suburban neighborhoods, which are massive. They were like upper middle class, successful families in Orange County, and we were kind of flying under the, the, that, that cloak, and no one really knew what we were doing. We kind of got away with murder, really. So some really good bands and some really good songwriters in a world class, even as teenagers, in those bands. It's a concentration of people. And it's a pretty, any suburb's a pretty frustrating place to be. You can't have an effect on anything. You've heard through the years the Orange Curtain. You know, but Orange County was definitely that. You know, you're behind the Orange Curtain. I grew up in, uh, like, the Huntington Beach area. I, I moved uh, to Fountain Valley in 1970. And I grew up in Fountain Valley, Huntington Beach, Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area. My parents lived in Placentia. We were out of the border of Fullerton. I walked across the street and I was in Fullerton. When I think about it, yeah, we're all Orange County you know, we came from fine homes, but yeah, why, why us? Why were we there? There were, there was other places to go. I wasn't from the beach. I was from um, the Anaheim area. For money, I sold flowers on cor you know, street corners, and we'd be picked up in a van and then dropped off in these very remote areas. People would pull over, and you know, I was robbed, I was beat up, because that was how the world treated me. My my response was uh, was was very agitated and very um, adversarial. It came from living in, in a place like Anaheim for, uh, for a long time. Being picked on and maybe that was part of my detachment and I learned to live with it and it was just no big deal to me after that. You know, after school it was just like shrug your shoulders and be tough and get on with it. Fuck the world. We already aggressive, semi-violent, you know, kids with nothing much else to do. And then punk rock was a perfect vehicle. If you were adolescent and angry and malicious and didn't know why, and punk rock came along and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I am, I'm a punk rocker. If you're gonna be punk rock, it means you're gonna, you better learn to fight because you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to fight in unorthodox places like coming out of the 7-Eleven two guys are gonna come out of their car and go, what's up, and it's on. Punk was just in your blood. It was just something that you didn't plan. You didn't apply to be a punker. You were just, it was like, you know, you just were that kind of person just because of your consciousness. There were things going on that were running parallel to music movements in the country, but that were, you know, in you know, Orange County were really, seemed very, very foreign. I don't think you could create those circumstances again. It was the beginning of the Reagan era, and a lot of young people, they're becoming politicized. We're from Orange County, we didn't care. We didn't want to be bothered with, you know, politics or agitators or whatever they were. We, didn't, we, we just liked the music. And sure, we liked the Clash, and they had some social conscience, but we didn't really take that from them because we, we took as much as we, as we needed, and we were just having fun. And because there was even you know, n no hope or interest. We're never going to get signed to Sire or Warner Brothers or something. We don't care. We just want to play. We want to make noise. We want to be wild. To go down to Huntington Beach was a bit of culture shock uh, when you go through, you know, the orange curtain. When in Costa Mesa, 
do like Costa Masons would do, burn it down. How did you uh, end up a punk rocker? I didn't like being like everybody else. You didn't so. want to be a hip? No. It's a way out. Yeah. If everybody came to face it, it wouldn't be anything different. Right. So, you know, it's, it's like, I'm here to bum lives. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> Me and my friend Carl, who lived on my same street, got into punk rock about 14, 15, 77, 78. Started listening to all that music. Dwayne Peters, he starts cutting guys' haircuts, you know, giving guys haircuts in the bathroom at the skate parks. And like overnight, there was this transformation. I mean, all of a sudden, we were skate punks. It was a fucking real individual thing. It didn't matter what you looked like, what your hair color was. What it was, you. That's what he decides to be. And, and we picked all of this up from, say, our, our, our brothers, our older brothers who were surfers, or some of us who were skaters. You know, I, I heard about it at summer camp, and I, I, uh, when I got home, I, I asked my brother, well, what's up with the punk rock thing? And I hear about it at summer camp. He goes, ask Steve Olson. He knows he's, uh, he's already into it. You would have, uh, I know I dyed my hair blonde or something. I met this woman from uh, Hollywood, Miss Mercy. Yeah. And she dyed my hair, and I was like pretty happening in the whole skateboard world. And that kind of flipped them out, like, whoa, what, what, what's going on? And then all of a sudden it was like, you know what, this is what's going on. The old hippies have to stay in the back now because you never knew what was going on in the first place. I think it's really neat because it's just people doing what they want to do. How come you didn't uh, become a hippie like uh, other people? I don't know. <laughs> I started uh, in 1974 playing bass. I was in a, basically a cover party band. Well, everyone else was saying to Aerosmith and Ted Nugent and stuff like that. I had a neighbor that, that was, he was like an oddball, you know. Through him, that's how I met Mike Palm and we started Agent Orange. I mean, we'd go to house parties and we'd just go to practice our studios and then just come back home late, hiding from our parents, sneak in, go back to sleep go back to school. I think the first time I went to the Cuckoo's Nest was to see the crowd. In the beginning it was house parties, you know, something that's just basically unheard of nowadays. It's, it's one real downfall of the youth of today is they'll never really experience that raging 150 person, three band, five kegger house party when your mom and dad was gone. To go see punk rock, um, you know, for in Orange County, if you grew up in Orange County, you, you, you could hear about a party, you might go see the crowd party or you might see Vicious Circle at a party in the early days. There's this man that, that decides for whatever ridiculous reason to set up a club in the middle of in the middle of Orange County for a bunch of kids that really didn't deserve one. You know it was, it, it was helping try and launch a new sound, a new scene, a new attitude that by necessity had to blow a lot of the weak and square and boring 70s music and dumb blow-dried hair on both sexes and everything out the window. Jerry had opened up the, the club up the street called the Cuckoo's Nest and it was still rolling along with your more mainstream rock bands at the time, you know, top 40 dance bands, things like that. We'd ride up to the club and just pound Jerry for a gig, you know, let us play, let us play, we'll bring people in. We didn't know what we were doing, it was just the blind leading the blind. It was just Jerry Roach calling, you want to play the cuckoo's nest with the adolescents. It was just one of those things that one night showed up there and there was something going on and just, just kept, on, kept on doing it. You, I, I think I was 17, but I had my brother's ID so I could get in. When Tony and I first met, it was the first time I went to the cuckoo's nest. It was the Go-Go's and Iggy Pop. I couldn't get in because it was 18 and over. And I mean, I know I got in at, a lot of times when I wasn't 18, but that night, that was what we were told. It was 18 and over. I was 16. It was my first experience with a fake ID. And it worked, because, you know, no they care. It wasn't that big a deal. It was a good venue to shoot pictures in because it had a tall stage. I mean, a lot of punk shows had a one-foot stage or something like that, so the crowd was just mixed with the band, but that stage was tall enough to isolate the people and be able to do photographs there. It was a party. It was moving 100 miles an hour. There was no road map. There was no list of things to do today. Cuckoo's Nest was one of those places that helped ignite the Southern Californian punk rock scene, which in turn 
helped ignite punk rock music and independent music all over America, because it was a very sexy scene. Punk rock just sort of happened to the Cooper's Nest. It wasn't planned. It was just a set of circumstances where business was off. These kids were bugging me for a gig. I thought, what the hell, they were trying. And all of a sudden, <laughs> all hell broke. The venue was big enough that it could hold a lot of people. The stage wasn't too high where you felt alienated from the people you were playing with. The blue clouds, the stage, and that was what's like, you, look, you see pictures today and you can just, wow, that's the nest. Most stages were black, you know, or, or something, but the nest, it stood out like a sore thumb with that baby blue and the clouds and stuff like that. I don't know whose idea that was to paint the clouds on the back of the stage. How can you have the cuckoo's nest without, you know, the clouds and the sky in the background of the stage? You knew immediately as soon as you saw that, you know, where it was. That was the cuckoo's nest, you know? Well, it was a cool room. I mean, it was like, it was an interesting setup because the stage was kind of in the corner and it was, it was just, it was not too big. It sounded good in there. It was perfect sound, it was unbelievable. To hold the Ramones and not fucking blow out like that or anything. I never heard anyone fucking, I can't hear myself in the monitor. I never heard one band fucking complain about the sound. That's all you're gonna, oh, it's sound here. It's fucking great. What we loved about the Cuckoo's Nest was the PA system was loud enough to turn it into a party. The stage was close enough to the floor where there was no barrier between us and all of the other party monsters. Elvis changed everything, and then the Beatles changed everything. And this punk rock thing shows up, and I really didn't like it, but after a while I realized, this is it, pal. You're not supposed to like it. Get with it. This is their deal. Sit back and watch it go. first time there, I believe the Stains opened, maybe in the first or second time I played there, which is an East LA, all Hispanic punk rock band, and the music was amazing. And the singer's name was Jughead, and he comes on stage in a trench coat, and his trench coat pockets were uh, full of 16 ounce cans of Budweiser. One of the best punk shows I ever saw was, I think it was uh, Black Flag's first show with Henry with the L.A. Stains and the Texas Stains, which became MDC. So he produces a can of Budweiser and points it at the crowd. The crowd's like, you know, I want one, I want one. So he gave some lucky recipient a full can, unopened, of Budweiser as hard as he could, throwing it into the crowd. I think that was the night a beer bottle bounced off my head. It didn't really change trajectory. It came from the back and went and kind of kept going. And I remember it hit some youth upside the head and bounced as a can will do when it hits the right part of the noggin and the thing made this beautiful poom, it like just like disappeared to like the back of the venue and everyone kind of had to admire the arc of the can like wow that, yeah that was good air on that one like, a little bit lower i would have been out <laughs> or thursday afternoon at school it's like who's playing the nest this weekend you know what are we going to do who's playing and it was oh there was always something i mean it didn't matter you had the jerks the ramones the tsol Black Flag, I mean, there was always a band. The Dead Kennedys came down and played once. You could see Iggy Pop there, you could see the Ramones, you could see 999. They brought in so many great imported bands from all over the states and all over the world that fucking kicked ass and it showed, it was like right there, here's flavor, you want flavor? We got it right here at the Cuckoo's and I said that there was no better way to grow up. I was tired of seeing the Ramones. You're gonna go see the, you know, I'd seen them six times already. What's going on tonight? What's at the nest tonight? What's at the nest? First question, every fucking night. You know, you'd go there and you'd see these bands and these bands were like our heroes. You know, 
TSOL and you know though we grew up with these guys and they're our friends but they were like our heroes they were like you know it was like we were part of that team. TSOL was like probably the most memorable band for us for and social distortion because they were more like the clash and TSOL was just like kind of damn but way cooler. And it was the troublemaker. I like the shocking people. I like fucking with people and that's what turned me on. I was uh, newly married and I had to you know, make money to feed my family, basically. I had to find some kind of job, so I was uh, selling real estate and I sold a big restaurant uh, to a guy who was in the business. So he heard that I had a bar when I was younger and uh, he asked me if I'd like to have a bar for my commission rather than the commission. So I quit being a realtor and I became a bar owner. The first, very first open, it was meant to be one of those meat markets. You know, Girl, put a band on that plays all the hits, people dance, you know. But uh, there was another bar called Jaws, and uh, the hot movie was Cuckoo's Nest, so just name it after a movie for no particular reason. And to me, it was as good as any, another, it didn't matter, it had no bearing on what was to happen. The fact that it turned into a Cuckoo's Nest. No, we didn't like Jerry, <laughs> he's a hard nosed dick. I was the businessman of the band. I saw, I saw that we sold the place out, I wanted more money. He didn't want to give me the more money. For a 16-year-old who, you know, who saw the, a lot of money coming in, and, and, you know, we felt like we should be paid, you know, a decent, you know, a decent amount of money. <laughs> we found out from the circle jerks and other people, you know, they were like, they were making more money than we were, so we were, we want to make the same money as circle jerks, and you all. Know, well, just get down here and complain. We're like, well, no, not now. And then we fought for a little while, I remember that. Jerry is in the room with us right now, so we won't say anything to denigrate him, but he was a real tightwad son of a bitch. And to get money out of him, you might as well go in with pliers and say, I need your molars. We felt that, uh, you know, all the way down the line that there were things that were due to us that we weren't, that we weren't receiving. So, you know, the, there was a certain amount of animosity and hostility towards the club itself which is rather ironic since it was the one place that we could go that, that um, uh, we could, would offer shelter. Nest sat on a, the about I'd say about one third of the way into a pretty deep lot, and then there was a, uh, a liquor store ending, which was you know uh, which hydrated a lot of people. When we pulled into the parking lot at the Cuckoo's Nest, was to proceed to 
get our party going early, and that would be tailgating, um, everything short of somebody pulling up with a keg in the back of the pickup truck. We'd have one friend, we'd make him not shame for like two weeks before, you know, a big show so he could try to go in and it looked like he was old enough to buy liquor. And there was a laundromat right there too, I think we used to go. We'd hang out in this laundromat and just drink beers and hide the beers inside the dryer. And anybody would come in, we'd shut the dryer and there's punks everywhere. And sometimes the party would just uh, stick around in the parking lot. Sometimes it wasn't about going inside, it was just about going into the parking lot and causing some trouble or watching the trouble unfold. You know, the cuckoo's in this parking lot. Shit, I lost my virginity there. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Didn't even know the girl's name. You know, we were the guys that got to the club first. You know, we were 16. We got somebody to buy a Foster's for us, and then we were snorting black beauties. We used to tell our parents, you know, we're, we're not hippies, we don't do drugs, but, you know, we'd be doing speed and drinking all the time, you know. Because I was offered drugs every single time I was in there as a compliment. I like you, do some speed. Like, no, that's, or do some more speed because people thought I was on speed when I was just on, you know, being hyperactive. Eddie Subtitle used to give us black beauties. Remember those little, like, pills? They were in black capsules, and we used to sell them to everybody. You just walk over the hoods of cars and see who's in where, and the regulars you knew, and then there was always new people there. In the back apartments, you'd jump in the cars, jump from car to car, hit Sherry Hatfield, these chicks over here, these guys over there, oh, some locker room, uh, want some coke on the next car, yeah, so-and-so's got a joint going right there. We, we're go Everyone's gonna end up at, you know, his real 50s meets the 70s. You gotta remember, Socrates said that the world was going to hell, or the younger generation was going to hell, and they weren't worth a damn, and he didn't know, he didn't have much hope for the future because the kids weren't worth a shit. And uh, essentially, uh, that's what they're saying today. There was like a lot of drinking, a lot of just fights. There was a lot of uh, a lot of crazy times. I remember we were like, you know, we had eaten some quaaludes, and there was a bouncer, and we were just like kids, and he was like some muscle muscle bound dude, whatever, doing his gig. But he was like, it's over, it's closed, you know, get the fuck out of here. And my brother was like, well, what are you gonna do? Kick our ass because we're not leaving. We're leaving. We're walking away. And he's like gets in some karate sense and my brother kicked him in the nuts right like and the dude went down and then we dogpiled him we didn't like sock him we didn't we weren't there to fuck him up we just like dogpiled him like and he lost his mind like he was screaming at the top of his head get off me you're trying to kill me and no one was throwing punches or anything we just thought it was funny that we'd subdued him with like body weight and we like got up and we were laughing it was like funny we were like stoned out of our minds and he was like, you're crazy. And we just were thinking, yeah, well, we're not crazy. We're just like having fun, man. And we just learned to like shrug our shoulders and say, hey, have a nice night, fuck face. It's over there. Hey, over here. Oh, oh father, oh, okay. you're going home? Yeah, good luck. He's going home, oh no. What? Go ahead and say something. Okay. Our main premise is to get people to hate us. Now Why? we're getting into this real good party. Why do you want people to hate you? Because everybody else wants people to like them. He went to get it. Uh-oh. No, I won't You know, and, you know, fuck them, man. You know, who wants to be liked? The people very close to me were upset by it. Like, Zubies, the guy next door who I shared a parking lot with, and the uh, uh, transmission place. When I didn't have anything on the lot, they just filled the whole lot. And, you know, like I say, they trashed a the lot. That's, that's what really bugs the hell out of me. You know, all the business people around here tried to do whatever they could to protect themselves. There was all this hoopla with the guys next door that, at Zubies and the cowboys and shit. You could, you could trash a few things, but there was a line that, you know, we all love this club and we've seen a bunch of clubs get shut down because of some of the behavior that we've brought into some of these places. Dave, uh, what was your most uh, fun, violent trip? <laughs> the gang fight between the bouncers here and Zuby. Oh yeah? yeah? That was last week, right? Two weeks ago, at TSOL. Oh yeah? What do you think of the Zuby people? Suck. Everywhere TSOL went, blood followed in the parking lot on the dance floor amazing band but their audience was trouble went beyond what some other people would do in some cases like i guess uh, 
TSOL got their equipment by scoping out a music store and smashing the front window and each knew what to grab and then suddenly they could play music. It's okay by me. Every time I try to walk by there, the cowboys try to butt fuck me now. They told us that fucking these are shit kickers and we're not allowed to wear them. Oh, yeah. yeah. We don't know how to kick shit. Yeah, we don't know how to kick shit. <laughs> we don't know how to eat it either, but they suck a lot of it over there. We truly believed the ethno and the ideal. We absolutely believed it. You know, and therefore we were reckless beyond belief. There was a lot of uh, a lot of hostility towards the towards the the club next door, which was like a cowboy bar. <laughs> there was there was just a lot there was a lot of friction that started to started to to, to uh, occur. You know, your devos and oh, why you look like that? And you're un American. You call me faggot. You're probably shooting heroin and selling child pornography on video. A new enemy reared their ugly head, and it was the, the cowboy redneck. The Southern Californian redneck, who is very well fed, very big, very able, and wants to indiscriminately punch the living daylights out of anything that looks like punk rock. And there they were at Zuby's sharing a parking lot with the Cuckoo's Nest and the punk rockers who were already dressed to challenge everybody. You know, they were looking for an enemy of some kind, and then they found it right there in their parking lot. I and mean, it was Orange County. What what enemies are, are is a redneck and a half? So they found us. It was it was pretty frightening. I mean, I, I know for one, I was only like 16, 17. I didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, punks aren't doing anything that bad. And the cowboys, not to mention the cowboys at Zuby's, hating the punks, antagonizing them, and calling them names for no reason and stuff. Of course, the punks would retaliate. You know. You know, like anybody would if you said, you know, you're ugly, I hate your guts, somebody would if you say, you know, no, I'm not, and like, wonder why they did it, you know? Like these cowboys, like, came out about five strong, they're all, hey, you homosexuals. They're all, you know, sitting around, and we're all 20 punks running around the corner. The cowboys turn, run back into their club with their tails behind their legs, 20 beer bottles crashing against the, the door they just ran in, just like a barrage of hand grenades in Iraq. It was, it was like oil and water in that parking lot where we had the hard hat guys and we had the punkers, and you can imagine it. In the evenings, you know, they're coming to dinner with their families, and these guys are coming to raise havoc. Yeah, they, what do they think of the punks? No, they don't like them. They don't? No, they don't like punks. What do they do? Gawk at them, uh, call them names, get into fisticuffs with them. They generally started? Yeah. Yeah, they generally start a lot of the problems. Invite them over to watch this movie. All you folks at Zoobies can fuck off, man. <laughs> and the Cuckoo's Nest had the potential, not only these cowboy ass-whooping jock types who will fight anybody. They'll fight the security. They were ready to go. I'd say about three or four months ago when uh, this big, this big, uh, this big cowboy guy. Uh, How big was he? He's about 6'8". He uh, got jumped by a bunch of punk rockers, so he said. And uh, so he went back to his car, got a 9mm uh, pistol, automatic pistol, came back and uh, wanted to shoot a few uh, punk rockers. And, and, you, and you were going to draw on him, right? Well, I, when he went found for the gun... A, a draw. I mean, you guys were going to draw on each other. It was like a Western shootout. Well, he, he, was gonna, he went down for the gun. And I just pulled my gun out and uh, aimed it at him and told him if he didn't get out of here and sh get away from his uh, ankle that uh, that was going to be the last time he ever walked. You know, you get a bunch of drunk rednecks in their pickup trucks and they see a bunch of crazy, you know, multicolored haired, spiked haired, mohawked haired guys and it's like, Hey, it's gonna be a gang fight. It wasn't even like the people at Zuby's were the, were the problem. It was a, a stereotyped person that um, that a lot of us had to deal with. Oh yeah, they used to come around and, and be tough and the punks would beat them up. You know, it's like one time we had a, a, a six guys in football helmets and baseball bats march up to the cuckoo's nest. They were gonna kick some punk ass. And the punks saw him and just went, oh boy, and about 80 punks took out after these six people. And they dropped their bats and hauled ass. It was great. So, uh, what do you think of the cops? They're okay guys, but they just take it to a limit a little too far. They're just jerks. How about the Pat Brown incident? The legend of Pat Brown, you know? 
Pat got drunk and tried to kill a cop. Actually, we left right before, right before the whole thing happened. An hour later, man, I heard all hell had broken loose, you know. Pat was a TSOL guy. Yeah. yeah, completely. But Pat Brown was a skateboarder before he was a punk rocker. I heard some stories about you too, but you don't want to go into that. <laughs> I'm a nice person. Pat, uh, you know, Pat especially, his greeting was a headbutt, you know, like, so that was, you know, that was another one of the police kind of setups. I want to be myself, yeah. be a person I want to be every day. I'm not, like, I'm not like everybody else on the street. What do you think about the explosion, the fact that everybody's becoming a punk rocker? It's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, always getting involved in craziness. It's, it's like when the police got him at night, you know, that when they finally got him, he just pulled over and goes, fuck it, what did I do? This guy we know, Pat Brown, was, uh, he was just in his car driving through the parking lot. This is like when the police were, like, catching me for any small, small thing that was going on. And Pat was just cruising, and he had a beer. He was just drinking a beer, looking for a parking place, whatever he was doing. And um, all of a sudden, this this cowboy guy dressed as a cowboy. He stopped, you know, Pat stopped, and it's like, this cowboy-like looking dude, you know, Pat was ready to have the guy say, you're a punk, I hate you, and Pat would have killed him, you know. But um, he just like, he goes, I'm a policeman, just like that, you know, and then Pat just like, he like reached in his car, and like, I guess he tried to turn off his car, or tried to, I don't know, choke him, or who knows what the cop was gonna do to him, but like, Pat just like, punch, you know? If you're in a car, you'd, you know, jet too. Uh, the cop is here, Pat is driving out, they're all, stop. Pat's all, no, floored it. Cop just goes, shit, I'm gonna get run over, right? We're all just hanging, right? And then unloaded a gun into a car with people everywhere as he's driving away with five or six people in the car. I talked to one of the kids that was in the car and said, yeah, Pat swerved at him. And then the cop got up, shot three rounds into the car. Could have killed one of those kids. We're all, There's a, somebody's got a gun. We're hearing these pops going. I guess the cop fired a few shots into Pat's car. He wasn't the same after, after the cops worked him. Uh, he was gonna beat him pretty beat bad. Him pretty bad yeah. yeah, he was never the same and that was the craziest thing that ever happened. I mean, our friend, uh, you know, pushed these undercover cops uh, out of his way and drove his car over them and ran off. <laughs> once you once you take a car anywhere near a cop, they're gonna they're gonna fire uh, shots at you and there's gonna be no litigation about it. There's gonna be no inquiry. And I think we all knew that. I think Pat, you know, eh, firing sh shots at me. He wasn't sitting around going, "This is outrageous." There's gonna be litigation <laughs> to be. Uh, this is a violation of my civil rights. Um, Pat was a very unique person. And, you know, God, God rest his soul. Rest in peace, Pat. Pat Brown, got, he fell off his bicycle, hit his head on a rock, died. Pat, wherever you are, punk rock heaven. I mean, they shouldn't start fights and stuff. Just have a fun time. Why go to clubs and have fights? For no reason. Beat one guy because he has longer hair or something. It's like Jack at TSOL. He has long hair. He doesn't start fights with anybody. <laughs> He's a hippie and down in his heart he is. It's like Ron and... And Todd, Todd loves Judas Priest. He's a hippie. I know, he told me he was going to go see him. I couldn't believe it. He's going to see Rush, too. Look at his <laughs> band. TSOL is a rock and roll band. They're not no punks. <laughs> They're out to make money. They're not even like punk rock. There's no such thing as punk. Pat Brown, rapping into the ground. Pat Brown, trying to run the cops down. Pat Brown, rapping into the ground. You didn't dance when the Ramones were playing with Jump yet. It was just like, the, this is the fucking, you know, these are the rules. You're not, you are not. You gotta dance the whole time. The next more we're like that. It wasn't so much, it wasn't violent us. Like inside, if you're just with your friends screwing around, you got a bunch of cocktails, you never been drinking and going nuts, then you just have a fight. It's just, let's have a fight. It was fun. Jump around, get sweaty, scream and yell, guzzle a few drinks, go back out, your paw going up and down, and then you kind of bounce sideways and run into your, the person next to you, and that's still cozy and fun. Um, and, and then some people decided to um, skip the up. Uh, when the dancing came from, went from pogo, which is one thing I could, okay, we're in the pogo, we're pogoing everybody, I'm only 16, everyone's scary around here. And then all of a sudden it went to what later was, I guess, coined by the uh, LA Times as slam dancing, when it went like that, and then it was this, it was punching. Uh, you know, it was dangerous. You didn't know what was gonna happen to you. But it was a, you know, it was a toughening up uh, area for uh, fighting anywhere else. 
the thing about uh, seeing the punk bands there, by now they were starting to do the, the slam dance and do the, the moshing. And that was the part that, that really um, this got me was the, you know seeing this physical contact and seeing these people just just bashing into each other. All these guys. Occasionally, you'd see a girl there. But it was pretty much you know a guy's uh, hangout, and um, it was just uh, electric. The slam dancing and all that stuff started there. Yeah, you know, looking back on it, like I said, I started realizing that uh, wow, that something something started there that was pretty earth shaking, and then it uh, it endured and it didn't go away. And that, of course, was the slam dancing, or what they want to call it, the mosh pit. Well, I think that it's it's just the overall influence of physical contact. I think that's a necessary element of the of punk rock, and uh, it's really easy to get involved in it because all of a sudden you're out there banging with someone, and it feels natural almost. You know, it's just fun. You're standing there on the side, and all of a sudden action starts behind you. <laughs> and you're, you're, you know, you're standing in the same place, but you're in the middle of the floor now, you know. So it's either slam out of there, stay <laughs> slamming in there, or get knocked down, you know. So you have to start slam dancing. Slam your way out. Right? You slam your way out. And that's cool. That's fun. Though you're bouncing up and down and sweating it up and running into each other, um, ultimately, um, no one's trying to hurt the other person at all. I'll never say that I started or invented slam dancing because I've seen monkeys in the zoo running around swinging their arms back and forth, you know, being all crazy. But my style was pretty running around, arms flailing, legs in the air, microphone. And a lot of the kids picked up on that and started to kind of imitate that style that I was doing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get five guys doing it, then all of a sudden 10 are doing it, and pretty soon 50 are doing the same thing, and it's turned into this big slam thing. It wasn't to the point where guys were slamming, trying to get the guy behind them in the face, but it was just, you know, just the style of the time was running around. Instead of pogoing, you know, which I would crave for after it turned into the fight days, you know, it's like, quit fighting, pogo, man, let the girls in here, that's what we're all here for, you know, but. Once the evolution started, it, it couldn't be stopped. And people have said, hey, you know, you're the guy that started slam dancing. And I'll say, well, you know, I had a certain style and some people picked up on it, but I would never, you know, be that arrogant to say that I started slam dancing. I do. <laughs> well, you have a good vantage point. Well, I don't, when I play, I don't really look, to be honest. But, um, but they're certainly not out there to get hurt. No, no one goes out to get hurt. 
I mean, I don't. I don't think anybody really does. And people were afraid to come <laughs> into the cuckoo's and my friends wouldn't come. Yeah. And I remember Jim Garano saying the first time he went out, afraid he was. And, then, and that was kind of part of the early thing was uh, nobody knew what was going to happen. And so there was an element of fear because you couldn't predict it. Yeah. He'd kind of, you know, walk around on the, the, the edges of the mosh pit. <clears throat> and he'd, he'd kind of take me along with him and go, you know, see, you, you, they're not indiscriminately, you know, pulling people in or beating people up. It's just the people that are within that circle, you know, they're all part of this little club. and, and like fake violence. Yeah, fake, fake violence. It was really a, an athletic kind of release, really. I mean, it was like football off the field. Well, you don't break bones or anything. You get bruises and swollen parts of your body. That's nothing really that big. You know, it's like a chaotic, really drunk high school dance. You know, you remember, you know, you know what it was like. And sometimes I remember you, you like just walking into the crowd and go, "Watch this," and just you know walk <laughs> through the crowd, and nothing would happen. The violence hadn't started yet. The whole black flag uprising and the, and the beat the hippies up and all that hadn't come into play yet. You never knew what was going to happen. It started off a lot of fun. And as Jerry knows, progressively, as more of the people that turned from football to punk rock and from wrestling got into punk rock and this and that, some bad elements started to come into it. It got labeled hardcore. It was a little more extreme, a little more intense, and eventually it got faster in tempo than punk had been. And uh, But there started to be so much stupid violence coming in. You know, people jump stage diving just so they could punch somebody in the back of the head, white power shirts showing up and stuff like that. But then these guys come in trying to, like, attack these kids, and they just get living shit beat out of them for it. Oh, my God. But I think the first thing said to me in this boiling mass of white youth who was glaring up at me, I think some young man with no hair on his head looked up at me and said, you better be good, you fucking faggot. Which is something that, you know, gets the blood going and makes you really want to excel. So the fear of failure, which would probably mean being dragged off stage and beaten, um, I sang my ass off. It was a period of time when a lot of the football jocks from high school that shaved their heads would come in and they thought punk was just about violence and beating people. And that's when the scene started kind of turning towards a negative. It was still fun to play on stage, but when you look down into the pit, it got very frustrating just to see guys just pounding the living crap out of each other when they're supposed to be there to have a good time and have some fun with some bands that they like. I was always relieved at the end of every show that no one was seriously hurt, you know, or no one, you know, although it looked like holy hell. Yeah, after each song, no clapping. Just, <laughs> just, just, all right, what else you got? We have to beat the crap out of each other, and you're the soundtrack, and you're lucky. I guess the, the acknowledgement that you're good is we're not going to turn on you on the stage. We're going we're gonna to keep beating the crap about it, out of each other, and you just keep playing. But the Nest had everyone from all over coming in. I mean, and it seems like when the Orange County kids and the South Bay kids and all the kids got involved with punk rock, it got a little more violent. And it got a lot uh, more intense and hectic. And I remember this one particular night when Black Flag was playing at the Cuckoo's Nest and I had walked down to the liquor store to get something. And when I returned, I came out of the liquor store and there's a man laying in the driveway and he had a hole in his head and blood coming out of both of his ears. And I picked him, you know, kind of cradled him, put my leather jacket over him. He didn't really know what happened. And, you know, the paramedics, police, there was tons of cops. And what had happened is this older man was at the laundromat down from the cuckoo's nest, and he was intoxicated, and he pushed a girl. She had told somebody, and then like 17 skinheads came down and jumped the guy and beat him in the head with a 12-pack and... Uh, just beat the guy. I heard he later died that night. But that was about the turn for me when I kind of got out of the scene because I was tired of all the violence. At one point, the singer guy, whose name I don't know, he picked up and either swung the mic stand or threw the mic stand, and the base of the mic stand hit a girl squarely in the head. She didn't see it coming. She had no need to be hit by a mic stand, and it hit her solidly in the head. 
she, it's like someone pulled a string out of her. Her body hit the ground and she went into these spasmodic convulsions and everyone kind of stopped. It was, it was so, such an awful sight that you got nauseous looking at it. Like, is she gonna die? I started walking down the street and people would threaten me. And I had, I had yeah, face-offs and fights and things like that in the street. And yeah, because people realized what it was connected with. And it was getting big enough to be a threat. Before it was a threat, someone could laugh it off. When it became something that looked like it was an actual um, replacement for what other people were doing, that what other people were doing was lamer and um, that it was basically tired and old, then um, those people respond in like with, um, it's like they, they put a culture tariff on it. They, they, make, they try to get rid of it. You know, they go, okay, this is, you know, well, I can't, I can't assimilate into this, so let's stop it. I've, I've, invested, I've invested years in my Led Zeppelin cool, so let's, you know, keep Led Zeppelin the happening cool so I can still get laid, you know, and I can still be cool, because when it goes out, I won't be cool anymore. Culture is a living, breathing thing, and um, any attempt to um, pin it down um, is futile. Uh, the police didn't really know what we were doing there. They didn't understand what was. They didn't understand that they had a youth movement going on. That was really a lot. That was that was something that they didn't recognize. They would pick certain people out by the you know the way you looked and your appearance. And I think it was my brother Jay and I. We were riding our bikes around and got pulled over. And they, you know, are you a punk rocker? And I said, well, of course, yes, I am a punk rocker, and very proud of it. And so was my little brother, you know. And they proceeded to put us down on the car and spread us out. And at the time, they were mugshotting everybody. And then they would keep a file of any vandalism or any acts like that they could go through and then at the time the Huntington Beach book was I mean this was like 1979 or 80 and it was already fat because they would anytime they saw something a little bit out of the ordinary they would just pull you right over and uh, and give it to you there was a lot of fear for punk you know the media grabbed that and really fucking twisted it up and it wasn't good for us with the cops or the punk rock file Everybody was on it with different different color hair. You know, every time you went to the police station, you'd see your picture and all these. Man, I haven't done green hair in a while. I haven't done it. You know what I mean? You have fun with these cops. They were very paranoid of the scene. There was always cops out front. Cuckoo's nest. There's uh, something going on over there. They'd have 20 cop cars over nothing. You know what I mean? And it just you know, and, and everyone's drunk. Let's fuck with them, and, I, and that's how. Pretty much anything got started and then it would escalate. You know, riot. Well, they went there and caused the riot because they wanted to practice crowd control. And really, it was just kind of a bunch of kids, so it really wasn't that dangerous for the guys in flak vests and helmets and sticks. But, uh, you know, you poke, this, poke the dog with a stick and you're going to get the required effect. You know, once you fuck with the, the Co Costa Mesa police and the Huntington, Huntington Beach police, you know, you're biting off more than you can chew. They always win. The Costa Mesa City Council tonight voted to close down the Cuckoo's Nest Rock Club, the only punk rock club in town. Ross Becker has the story. For the young people in the audience at tonight's council meeting, the issue was the survival of punk rock and their place to enjoy it. For the management of Costa Mesa's only punk rock club, the outcome of the meeting could mean the survival of their business. The city council had to decide if the stories of bottle throwing, fighting, vandalism, and underage drinking at the Cuckoo's Nest are true. The owner of the Cuckoo's Nest told the council his club is being harassed, that he's tried to cooperate with the police and the club's neighbors, but he said there seems to be another reason for what he calls an assault on the social phenomenon. Club employees and patrons told the same story, but the police and some of the club neighbors think the problem is not punk rock, but the punk rockers, the ones who they say are causing trouble. People being extremely loud. What I mean by loud is just uh, out, out really just screaming, yelling. Uh, definitely would attract your attention if you're any, anywhere in the area. Uh, broken beer bottles all over the place. The council listened. They listened for more than two hours. Then they had to decide. Councilman Don Hall said the problem will not go away. And Councilman Ed McFarland told the overflow crowd, don't blame us, we didn't create the problem at the Cuckoo's Nest. The young people left before the vote. 
it was obvious they lost. News Nest is closed for tonight. It was a 4 to nothing vote of the city council, but the manager says it won't be for long. He's taking the case to the Superior Court here in Orange County. He says it's a constitutional issue, and the city council should not be allowed to ban punk rock. They tried to get rid of me. Actually, that's why uh, uh, I, I sort of turned uh, radical. I, I spent most of my time trying to placate him and make him happy and, and, and keep it under control. But once they tried to get rid of me, then I kind of let it go wild. And uh, I really just wanted to uh, shove punk rock right up their ass. I reopened uh, May 1st, May Day, with Black Flag, May 2nd, TSOL, with Agent Orange and the adolescents. And in other words, I reopened and I was completely over triple capacity the very first night I reopened. Basically, I knew once the city wants you, they're going to get you, so I decided to go down swinging, you know. Well, the cops. Not only, you know, they wanted that venue gone. They saw Jerry and his venue as a big problem. It was something that was potentially out of their control. And the cops sought to control Jerry and the club. And this music, this youth movement that was so powerful. I mean, you, you do enough crazy things and you bring enough exposure to yourself, you know, you're, you're gonna end up paying the price. The writing a thousand tickets in three nights, you know, when they go to the board meeting, that looks real good. Like, you know, the board members are like, oh my God, it's a crime wave, we must shut it down. But the dancing, I think, was the final thing, which might have been as simple as tapping your foot because he didn't have a permit. It was just like, uh, new rules, you can't, ha you, you need a dance license and we're not going to give it to you. So I, I uh, basically, eventually, they started arresting so many people that nobody, people quit coming anyway. You know, to call it violence where, you know, somebody's getting getting killed or something is, is, is pretty ludicrous. I mean, it's just, it stems from somebody on the outside trying to sensationalize it or trying to simplify it. Jerry got closed down for the dancing with, I think, the final Achilles heel. That's when, the way they found it. We'll get him this way. The officialdom wants things to stay the same. They want things to run smoothly. They don't want these hiccups of, of unexpected, unpredictable, behavior and and you know pretty much as long as you've got teenagers on the planet <laughs> you're gonna have that in some form or another it's like illegal or something or it was illegal and, and you felt like it was illegal when you were doing it you know they, they that's what really got me I would have probably fought longer if I still had the people but because of the mass arrest uh, it became really more than a game to go there now it was you could go to jail and it's well documented that you know they arrested uh, you know, hundreds, <laughs> big sweeping. They arrested me in one of their sweeps. They arrested a lot of people for jaywalking. One guy got it for not cramping his wheels against the curb. One guy got it for not wearing eyeglasses. Well, because his, his license said he needed to wear eyeglasses. Eventually, the, the word was out. Uh, if you go to the Cougars Nest, you might get arrested before you get inside the building. I mean, they were, they were ready to like, literally take on the entire audience. They had 25 cars there and they had they were all lined up out, outside, you know, in full force, and they were like, they, they had the two cops in two formations outside so that they could come into the parking lot without being outflanked, right? And put a pincher on the audience that was, you know, as they would come out of the club, right? And the people who were still in the parking lot, and they were ready to do that. They were ready to close the thing down and basically, physically take on the entire audience. Yeah, it, it, back then there, was, there wouldn't be like a punk rock benefit to save the cuckoo's nest. That would have been weird. You would have thought, what's Jerry? He owes me 50 bucks or something like that. <laughs> I don't think anyone would. But today, if it was a club shut down today for five seconds, there's a benefit. You know? It was fun. I mean, those days were fantastic. I don't think they'll ever happen again, not for me. Aren't they happening right now? Well, there's, there's, I don't know, maybe this will be the first time in history that, that um, the authorities and the powers that be will, uh, uh, you know, uh, st stamp out a fad by uh, repression. But I think it just makes it stronger. You know, it was so damned exciting, but it was a monster. It was uh, overwhelming in so many ways. In a sense, I was relieved when it was over.
that an indication that Punk Rock is dying? That it was just as bad that just passed? I don't see how anything so, so heavy could just die out that quick. I just think we'll see more repercussions, and, and I think it, it's festering under, bubbling under, as they say. These were hit records that didn't become radio hits because they weren't corporate major labels, and, you know, if Rodney didn't play it, nobody would except the college stations. But uh, in retrospect, it doesn't surprise me that the OC sound was kind of the cradle of what made bands like Bad Religion and then later much bigger Green Day and Offspring especially who openly traced their lineage to TSOL. You know, they got big because finally the masses heard that type of punk sound. No one knew this was going to do what it did. I, I mean, I mean, if you really look back to Orange County and what was going on, everything nowadays is influenced from that scene. And, and especially looking at it, it's like we were scumbags. We made our own clothes. It's like no one gave a shit. I knew enough to know back in those days that we were part of something that was really, really important. So yeah, I, and, I, and I was right about that. We were clueless. If anybody says to you from, from our group of bands and musicians and people that yes, we knew that this was gonna turn out to be as big as it is. And we knew that the Warp Tour was going to start because of this. And we knew that Green Day was going to sell zillions of records because of this. And Blink-22, and New Found Glory, and no, oh, yeah, all of these other Paramours, and all of these other bands, they're full of shit. They can go fuck themselves because they're 100% wrong. Every teenager goes through that period where they just want to say fuck everything and you know, and, and punk's pretty much like, there it is. It's so like real and angry and I think the fact that I could relate to it. You, you believe in it, you know what I mean? It speaks to you, grabs you and it's just, uh, it's true. Like, you know, second generation hippies now, they're second generation punks. It's like they could be into a lot worse stuff so I can't believe it, but it's kind of funny. The kids are now like 12 years old with my band, Black Flag Shirts On, ref asking me what life's all about. And I don't really know either, but I have a great time trying to pretend I do. We were like 12, 13, this like Black Flag and the Germs and like all those like TSOL, all that kind of stuff. TSOL, Black Flag, Circle Jerks. A lot of people are claiming punk rock, and I'm, I don't care. I mean, people could say they're punk or whatever, but all I know is for me and for us, like if we play a show at the vault, well, we're gonna have like BI play and then we're gonna have the diffs play. Old punk rock dude, groundbreaking shit. I, I feel indebted to them. It's same struggles, same same pissed off about what's going on. I mean, people now call it, oh, old school punk, old school hardcore. There wasn't any school back then, that's ridiculous. We were blowing up the school. I'm very proud of the role Dead Kennedys played in burning down the Hotel California. We're the Vietnam vets. You know what I mean? You can go buy a Skull and Crossbones t-shirt now because we were doing it then. You have everything from whatever, uh, the Warp Tour, which I'm not putting down, I'm just saying everything is kind of ferrot and all the highways are paved. When we were there, it was kind of like dense underbrush. You kind of hacked your way through. The legacy, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is not really that big of a deal. I'm just always amused, I guess. I just smile when I see somebody, you know, walking down the street with a mohawk. I mean, it really was um, a statement at the time, and it really did cause these people a lot of, you know, personal um, hell that they went through to, to dress like this and to act like this and do those things. They got stopped on the street and beat up. In a lot of ways, it's the same scene with a bunch of new kids. They're singing about Arnold Schwarzenegger, not about uh, you know, Ronald Reagan. And so, it works for me, you know? I mean, it sounds like punk rock. <laughs> it smells like punk rock. I think it is punk rock. When you went to a show, it was electric and alive, and you didn't really know what was going on. Although, I wonder sometimes now, like, if the, the young kids at some of the shows don't still feel that. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not fair for me to say that it, it doesn't completely exist, because may, it may be still, like, electric and exciting and new, although, it's not as new as it was, because it really was forging new ground. 
anyone can cop a punk rock sound. You know, you make three chords, fuck, say some angry lyrics, blah, 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 you're a punk rock sound, but, but you're not a punk rock. It, it's not the same attitude. It's not the same thing. So now you see these guys, and they all look alike, and, and they dress alike, and they have tattoos, and they wear the outfits and whatever, but, but it's just the middle of the road, man. It, it's straight up fucking middle of the road. It's not out there. It's not, it's not. I don't know. It, it's just something I, I really struggle with, man. Fucking playing your music, doing your own thing. I'm some kind of an ass. Fucking not giving a fuck if anybody else likes it, not giving a fuck if anyone cares. Then you could be a punk if you want to be a punk. I was intertwined uh, with the cuckoo's nest. There wasn't much difference between Jerry Roach and the cuckoo's nest, so it was always personal. And Jerry always had this really kind of lighthearted approach to the whole thing. It's like it, these were kind of you know, people that he really enjoyed watching and just the whole scene was, was intriguing. I don't think Jerry had to fight it as long as he did. I think he did it because he, it became personal, which made him one of us and not one of them. So I think, you know, although we were adversaries when they were kids, uh, when they grew up, they realized uh, that I was really okay. If we were out in the parking lot, there was a problem. Uh, Jerry to come out and walk us in, open the door and say, get inside. Uh, I don't want to see you guys get arrested, which was, you know, uh, very parental of him. In retrospect, I think that he was absolutely bonkers and mad for doing it. The overhead, the risks, the damage to one's uh, uh, psyche, it couldn't have been a an enjoyable time to have, you know, uh, 30, 30 guys like me just, you know, angry and bitter and and, 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 you know, and tearing into, tearing into this man, but it was what was going on, and he took it all, you know, he took it all with stride. Jerry got a bad rap, and there's, there's, there's a lot of people that talked a lot of shit about him over the years from the bands because they thought they got ripped off, but, you know, I think, then you might think that, but then you gotta think about all the bills, you know, the lawyer fees that he probably had to pay for all the legal troubles he was going through, and, you know, there wasn't, how much money can you make when you're playing a show that costs three dollars to get in and you know okay so 400 people show up what there's twelve hundred dollars how much money do you want you know the guy's got to pay his rent we didn't behave very well back then you know so i got to give him credit for even putting up with our shit you know we're always sneaking people in we're always fighting with the security we're always you know doing something you just we're he was dealing with just all these menaces and my band might have been one of the some of the shows were so sketchy and so stressful just for somebody to put on that I noticed a pattern even all over the country of how many underground punk promoters, especially the ones who were a little older than everybody else, were clinically insane. <laughs> <laughs> and to his credit, as I remember, Jerry Roach was always very fair to Black Flag. As I remember him as a guy who actually paid us. And in those days, it wasn't always the case. I respected Jerry as a business owner, and I didn't want to mess with him. You know, we were 16-year-old punks full of angst, and they're authority figures. But without Jerry, I mean, that the whole Orange County scene wouldn't have been what it was. Yeah, Jerry helped us out a lot, you know. when when In the early days, when the Daily Pilot and the Register and the LA Times were doing interviews about you know, what was going on and if there was bad seeds or good seeds. I mean, Jerry always stood up for us. The gravity of what Jerry Roach did is unmeasurable to change rock and roll history because he pretty much started a movement and helped a movement evolve out of Orange County, not to mention challenging the police department, challenging social ethics, morals, everything involved. I don't know what would have happened if there wasn't the cuckoo's nest. I don't think there would have been anywhere else, really. No one it, seemed open-minded enough to open it up. Yeah. No. You know what I mean? I'm not here to thing, suck the ass of Roach, thing. but like you did like give everybody no. You know what I mean? Like now that you're a little older and you have a little bit of a fucking clue. Roach was like the dude who let us come to his place and have a good time. I don't know. I, I know I had a lot of great times at the Cougar's Nest. Jerry introduced me to my wife, who I've been married to for 20 years in November. How about that? That's a good memory for Jerry Roach. <laughs> Jerry, he's a good one. <laughs> The hippies, I don't think, really believed in love that much, and I don't think the punks believe in hate that much. It's just something, I think it's shock value, and it's something like saying, hey, look at us, you know? Look at me, I'm different, I'm not, I'm something new, and uh, what are you gonna do about it? But this is what people went through to try and carve out a place to play this music that 
the establishment, as it was called then, was against, and the music establishment was against as well. Punk, you know, punk rock, just a bunch of Neanderthals or something, and, you know, and so much history is painted of the violence and the slam dancing and, you know, people getting hurt and you know, people warming on glass and all that stuff. That, I'm sh I mean, a lot of that stuff did happen, but there was guys and bands writing songs that, you know, still hold up today. And we were all from this little chunk of this corner and, you know, I mean, just if Fullerton alone had Agent Orange, The Adolescence, and Social Distortion. Who would have thought that 30 years later people are still talking about this little nightclub, The Nest, in Costa Mesa, California? And it is. It's, it's legendary. It was a pretty magical time, you know, that little stretch of a few years in the late 70s, early 80s, where all, you know, a, there was a lot of great bands. It was, it was about the only venue that a lot of these bands could play, and so it was a really, it was a hub, you know? I miss the Cuckoo's Nest. It'd be nice if they had a place like that now for the kids, but then the kids would probably want to book Britney Spears or something. I just know that we're always doing something we couldn't, but without that place, we wouldn't have really had anything to do. It's a great place to go, and anybody that didn't get to experience a club like that in punk rock, I mean, I know there has been other little bastions, you know, so to speak, but that was a golden time, and it was a great club youth at its finest and you know looking back and uh and at the time it was so fucking adrenaline exciting and uh and just a new movement and and uh and everybody felt like you could be a loser we we're just skateboarders and you just felt like you belong you had a place to go and and the old ways were done okay this is why we get beat down all day is for things like this and people came from all over I don't know, all because I was so young, all the inside politics, and I'm glad I didn't know. Because I know music inside and out, it's a dirty business, but I fucking know that it was fucking, it was clean for me. Punk rock is a lifestyle. Punk rock is a way to be, you know, it's a very beautiful thing. I think it's helping save the world, personally. When people really think full circle and just like get read between the lines, the truth comes out that the Cuckoo's Nest is one of the purest, most awesome places that has ever existed anywhere on earth. You know, that's why I joined the Vandals. It was, it was that's what, to me, this is what my kind of punk rock was all about. Man, we were having a blast. And there was all kinds of stuff going on. There was some danger, and the cops were there, and the cowboys were there. And we were going to sing about it, and we were going to tell the world about it. To, to be a participant in it was really, really exciting. And uh, uh, and I know to be a club, a club owner, running a club, and for the bartender, for everybody that was that was there watching this, this, this um, storm, going on. It must have been a very intriguing, because there was nothing like it going on anywhere. You're leaving the town, and don't look back, man. You're turned to stone. Let me ask you, was it fun? Oh, oh my God. That was about the most fun job I've ever had in my life. Um, well, it's just exciting, isn't it? It was like nothing else. I'm glad. I'm glad that it's been fun. And so um, I'm glad I survived it. I'm glad I had a chance to play there. And I'm glad it was my first time being on stage with Black Flag. Because I, I, I came out of that two sets later, figuring if I can survive this, man, I can survive anything. Now that I look back on it, it was really a cool scene that went down. And totally stoked to be a part of it. Jerry opened his doors and let us play there. The Cuckoo's Nest was an amazing spot. The Cuckoo's Nest is embedded in one of my honeycombs forever. It was a long, hard road. It burned hot and fast. And it wasn't meant to last.
couldn't make it as a punker. <laughs>